delighted to have you all here and share our special guest today, Rabbi, 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 Dr. Raphael Zaro. I could give you a long list of academic accolades to tell you about Rabbi Raffi, but I'll give, you a I'll give you the short version as you can look him up and learn about him. What I rabbi Dr. Raphael Zaro is the Rabbi Sachs Chair of Modern Jewish Thought. He is Dean of the London School of Jewish Studies, LSJS, the UK's premier Jewish institution for training, teaching, scholarship, and adult education. He lectures in Jewish education and classical texts and trains teachers and rabbis. He has an MA in adult education, a PhD in theoretical physics, gained rabbinic ordination from the Montefiore Kollel and Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, and is a graduate of the Mandel School in Jerusalem. He was the first head of faculty of the Florence Melton Adult School in the UK, and he teaches across the Jewish world, online and in person. Many of you are familiar with Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Sichuan Levracha, blessed memory. What you may not know is he was Rafi's mentor, his teacher, his guide. They formed a special bond when Rafi was a teenager. When Rabbi Sachs died, it seemed natural that Rafi would continue his teachings and further them with his own thoughts and ideas that he's been working on all his life. And thus was created the Rabbi Sachs Chair of Modern Jewish Thought. Let me introduce to you my brother, Rabbi Rafi. Thanks, Lonnie. Lonnie's my number one fan, which is great. <laughs> it's, it's so good to be here with all of you. I've got a little handout, don't be afraid, but this will, maybe one between two, and we will, uh, we'll go through this. Um, and hopefully I'll make it interesting. I know that on a Saturday night, you're probably normally sitting in front of the, on a sofa, maybe sitting in front of the TV, watching a, uh, watching a movie. So I'm the movie for tonight. I'll try and make it just as interesting. Um, and feel free to get some popcorn uh, in the break as you go. Um, so Lonnie asked me to speak about um, some ideas from Rabbi Sachs. And... Let me just tell you, I'll just, let me just begin with a little story about when I first heard him to speak. I think I was 14 years old and he had began a new lecture tour and he was giving his first lecture about community and my father took me to see him, to go to this lecture. Mm -hmm. And I still, I, I remember still one line of what he said because he was talking about building a community and he said, what is the ideal size of a Jewish community? And he said... I remember it's still as clear as day. It's the amount of people that a rabbi, the rabbi can get to know well. I don't know what you think about that as an idea, right? Which was about 100 or so families, maybe. And he talked, even at that time as well, about being very practical about community. But what I want to talk about tonight is some of his philosophy, some of his ideas, and discuss them with you. And hopefully you'll see some relevance for your own life and definitely, well, definitely all of our lives. So... He wrote 40 books. It's pretty impressive. Um, he lived till 72, and he began writing already in his, in his 30s. And he wrote on many different subjects, books on philosophy, books on prayer, books for a Jewish audience, and also Jew books for a non-Jewish audience. Um, each one trying to relate to a particular idea. And... What I would say about him more than anything else is he was a, what I call a responsive philosopher. He was responding to the issues of the day and to our modern challenges. So I'm just going to set up two questions, well, two issues that he talked about, and then we'll analyse this text that I've handed around. And this is about contemporary challenges that we have, and this relates a little bit to our conversation earlier. The first one is the challenge between authority and autonomy. He writes, about this book in, he writes about this in the book, The Politics of Hope. What's authority and autonomy? Let me explain. The modern person believes that I am the decider of my life. I'm an individual. I can choose what I want to do. And there is no higher authority that can tell me what I want to do with my life. There might be rules, but I can be the chooser of my life. Whereas religion, and Torah definitely, is authoritarian. 
There's a commandedness from the Torah. You are obliged to do these laws, going back thousands of years. And the modern person, and I teach many young people, they have this challenge between the two. On the one hand, wanting to be an individual, choosing their own life, making their own decisions of their moral values. On the other side, a few thousand year old tradition with commanded and rules of what you're supposed to be. And that is a, a, a dichotomy. And as adults, many of us have that idea as well. I want to choose what I want to do, but I have this feeling of pressure sometimes for my tradition of what I want to do. Some people embrace it. Some people run a long, a long way away. And some people come to terms with it in different kinds of ways. But that's one of the challenges. And interestingly, in this book, Rabbi Sachs's book, To Heal a Fractured World, I think it's 2008, he has a very clever way of responding to that issue. He doesn't say it's not a dichotomy, but a way of putting the two things together, which I'm going to tell you about. But before that, let me tell you a fundamental idea that he always talked about, which is the way we look at society today. And he was a political philosopher by training. He studied in Oxford and in Cambridge. And the point he made was, is that we look at ourselves today in two ways. Or rather, society looks at us today in two ways. As voters, and I'm going to be very careful here being in America, but as voters and as consumers. Most of the time, that's how we relate to each other. What do I mean? Not just what political party do you support, but the, uh, that whole ideology reflects your attitude towards life on so many issues. By the way, in America, even more than in the UK, in terms of your attitudes towards many aspects of life, where do you sit? And what are you? So much so that it causes arguments between two different sides. And there was, um, oh, I've forgotten his name now. Who was the, the director who made Seinfeld? He did his own, uh, Larry David. There was a, in his uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, that's it, one of the episodes of Curb Your Enthusiasm, he's, a, he's, a, he's with a woman, let's say. He's, a, he's with a woman, and uh, they're in bed together, and in the middle, and uh, he looks by the side, and there's a, a photo of a, Republican senator, <laughs> right? And he just can't continue, <laughs> right? Because she's a Republican and he's not, and he goes, we have to end the relationship. It's a very, very funny scene. But it's to the extent of, and it causes huge arguments, you know, in our society here. But you're often defined in so many ways of what is your political position, and you're seen as a voter by the government in terms of attracting you to their point of view. That's one part of it. That's the political sphere of society, which is very powerful. And every uh, society has that. The second way we looked at, which is even more powerful, in my opinion, is as a consumer. This is the economic structure of how we look at you. You are consumers, and we need to sell to you in order to improve our company and develop our product and make you... And you as a consumer believe that you need the newer model of whatever it is we are selling to you today. And it controls us. The GDP, the whole idea of progress for society, and, uh, and uh, in fact, and companies growing, the rate of their growth is dependent on people consuming more. And the, the idea of a, of a good economy and a good society is, is it growing? And we are seen in those two spheres. And Rabbi Sachs argued, but we're not just consumers, and we're not just voters. We're people who want to commune in society. And what's the role of morality in society? Where is that taught? In schools, people learn understanding of politics and understand financial through mathematics and issues similar to that. But where do we learn moral responsibility or moral compass? It's amazing. You go to school to study so many things, and there is no class about that. How did that happen? Because it used to be, going back 100, 200 years, people had a moral sense. It was taught naturally as part of religious faith. Now, I'm not saying we necessarily need to return to faith for everybody, but we need, and Rabbi Sachs argued this, whether you're of faith or not, you need to have a source of morality and ethics. And it used to be a natural issue. Now, a great example he gives is, who is the greatest economist that our modern economy and capitalism is based upon? Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations. He wrote that, I've got my notes here, he wrote that in 1776, The Wealth of Nations, about the, uh, the hidden hand of capitalism and how society works. But people forget that in 1759, he wrote a book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments and the Importance of Empathy, what we would now call sympathy, between other peoples. In other words, it was assumed that there was a moral ethic 
to society going back 200 years. So when they talked about capitalism and the growth of economics, it was built on a bed of and a fundamental morality in society. That has been lost with the loss of faith in the modern world. And Rabbi Sachs' argument to politicians and leaders around the world was, we need to bring it back. Whether it's a faith community or a different kind of community, that is what the world is missing. And if we don't have that, our society is in huge trouble and great problems. That was his third element. So, and I, I always have to say that when I describe his ideas because it's a fundamental one in his. So if you read his last book, Morality, uh, before he passed away, it's very much about that issue, how to return to the common good and responsibility of society. We are not just consumers, we are not just voters, we're human beings with, with values that we need to share and work together in society. Now, with that background, we can now do a little bit on this handout, which is, what is the relationship between authority and autonomy that I was talking about to you earlier? Now, look at this one-liner that he puts at the front here. I've got it here just underneath the title. Where, where what we want to do meets what is crying out to be done, that is where we should be. Now, I don't know about you, I'm sometimes cynical of these modern public speakers who have these really beautiful one-liners that sound great when you hear them, but then you go, what exactly does that mean? And they kind of, they're gone before you find out what they're talking about. But I want to unpack, what does Rabbi Sachs mean when he says, um, um, where what we want to do meets what is crying out to be done, that is where we should be. Now, to answer it, we have to go on a bit of a journey to a particular Jewish idea. And that is about making a bracha. You're all familiar with it. We just did a whole bunch of brachot for Havdalah, for bringing out Shabbat. And why we make brachot. And when we make brachot, when we make blessings, and we don't make blessings. So Rav Sack says, look at what Maimonides, 12th century philosopher, wrote. This, you've got it in your handout over here on the laws of blessings. He says, Yesh mitzvot she'adam oser she'adam chayav lishtadel v'ledof ad she'aser otam. There are certain, there are positive mitzvot, positive commandments, do's, not don'ts, do's, uh, that a person is obligated to make an effort to pursue until uh, to do them. For example, wearing to fill in. So a person should make an effort to put tefillah in the morning, or sitting in a sukkah on sukkot, or shaking roll of an etrog, or, the, or hearing the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, you should make an effort to hear Rosh Hashanah on the shofar. So if you live away from the synagogue, you should make an effort to get to the synagogue to hear those things. And he says... These are obligations, and a person should, should do them. Then he says, there are a whole bunch of other commandments that are not obligations, but are like voluntary activities. Kugot, he says, um, domin le What does that mean? For instance, attaching a mezuzah on a house. Why is that optional? So it's not that if you've got a house, there's an option of putting a mezuzah on. He'll explain. He says, but these are partly optional, like putting mezuzah on a house or putting a guardrail on a roof. People don't know this law. In the Torah, it's a kind of early example of health and safety, um, uh, very strict rules. I think the Rav, uh, you know all about health and safety with the new building that you're doing, the Chabad Center. They're very strict about these things, health and safety. Um, but the Torah talks about it. If you have a roof that you can walk upon, you need a guardrail on the edge to stop people wandering and maybe falling off. It's a great responsibility. Um, there's a, I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the James Bond movie Skyfall. It's one of my favourite ones from 2012. And he's chasing the baddie, and they end up on the London Underground. And the baddie jumps on a train, and it, the doors close, and Bond's running after, and he jumps on the train at the end and opens the door and comes into the carriage. And everyone looks up quite shocked, and he goes, health and safety. And he just walks through, and everyone's like, OK, fine. And it's a great joke, because in, in England, in terms of building construction, maybe here as well, health and safety is the thing you have to get past in order to build anything or to look after anything. Anyway, so, um, so uh, building a, a, a mezuzah on a house or a guardrail. Why are these optional? Because a person is not obligated to dwell in a house. Indeed, they can dwell in a tent or on a ship their entire life. So what is he saying? If you live in a house, then you need a mezuzah. If you have a roof you can get to, then you need a guardrail. But if you don't, then you don't have to do those mitzvot. You understand? So certain mitzvot, you know, whatever kind, you have to try and hear the shofar no matter what. But mezuzah only applies if you live in a house. If you live in a tent, um, not so many of us live in tents now, uh, then you need a sukkah. Then, 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 you, then you need a mezuzah. Similarly, he says, a person does not have to build a house in order to build a and, and guardrail, so on. And then he says the following. For all positive mitzvot that are between a person and God, whether they are obligatory or not, as I've just said, you have to make a bracha. 
So if it's a positive mitzvah, but he adds a thing between a person and God. Now, you know, there's two, uh, there's another way of dividing mitzvot. There were two kinds of mitzvot. Ben adam le makom and ben adam le chavero. Ben adam le makom are laws between you and God, like prayer or keeping Shabbat. Okay? It doesn't necessarily help somebody else doing it, but you and your commitment will keep Shabbat as an obligation towards God. Right? Or doing Seder on Friday night. There's a whole bunch of other mitzvot, very important ones, which are interpersonal. Between one person and another. Giving charity. Looking after people. Making sure people are secure and, and, and cared for. Not being angry or bitter with people. And he says, for all the mitzvot that are between you and God, right, you should make a blessing, a bracha. So what about the others? What about the others? And that's what he talks about. So let me ask the question, when you give charity, do you make a bracha? Right? When you, when you visit somebody who's not well or in hospital, do you walk in and before you sit down with them, you say, I'm just going to make a bracha? You don't. You just do it. Why are there no brachot for those laws? But there are brachot for other laws. And this became a huge debate amongst the rabbis. Why are some religious obligations have a blessing towards them and others don't? What's the reason why? So, Rabbi Sachs lists over here, and I've given you an example of the two different kinds of laws between people, interpersonal ones, and between you and God. So he asked the question, why is there no... Maimonides says you don't need to do it, but the question is why? So before you read here, you read ahead, let me ask you, why do you think you need to make a blessing on certain laws, but when you're giving charity, you don't make a bracha, a blessing? Why do you think? Anybody got any ideas why that might be the case? It's a non-rhetorical question. <laughs> this is interactive. Yeah, no, it's all right. What do, you, what do you think? Why would it be? Go on, Doris. The act itself is a blessing. Pardon? The act itself. We're going to get to that. That's, that's what Rabbi Sachs talks about. It could be seen in that way. Yeah? Um, perhaps you don't want to interrupt the action with the brother. That's interesting, isn't it? Because when would you do it? Right? Right. You know? I mean, what is the first mitzvah in the Torah? Be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? So there's a question, you know, if you're giving charity or visiting someone, when would you make the bracha? It could be a technical issue. Other possibilities? Yeah? I think there's one guy that you see, and one guy that comes to visit the not healthy man or yeah. give the charity, and the other guy is not. So if you said you want to say blessing, mm -hmm. And you are the guy that gave what if the guy that's like the other side of the. Ah, right, you're doing it in front of them. Yeah. You're doing it in front of them. And so, how do they feel about it? Right? Because are you visiting them to get a mitzvah to God so you get into heaven, you know, to weigh the scales on the positive side, or because you want to be there for that person? Yeah. It's a good point. You're standing in front of that person. Yes. There's a thought, uh, an idea in civic philosophy that uh, before you make a blessing or a period, you'll meditate, maybe go to the mikvah, you make a present. So you have to get the charity of somebody and you'll take the time to go to the mikvah and make a blessing. It's a very good point, actually. You have to be kind of in the, in the religious focus moment in order to do it. Okay? But, you know, maybe you need to, you know, so you, you know, you're, you're, you're driving by someone who's broken down. Right? And they need help with their car. And you go, hang on a second, I've just got to go and pray to do this blessing before I can, before I can help you. Right? It'll be a problem. So, it's a big debate in Jewish law. Over here, I've got four different answers. And we're going to get to the answer. You went straight away with, the, with what my Rabbi Sachs says, because well, you met him, so I'm not surprised. Number A, and you're thoughtful as well, actually, that's why. Number A, um, uh, the, uh, the rush by the 13th century, his explanation was that it's not fully in your power to assist somebody. So you might give charity, but is it the amount of charity that person needs? Have you completed the mitzvah? You know, the rabbis are very strict about laws. When you make hamotzi on bread, how much bread that you eat, how much wine you drink on Seder night. So how much is enough charity? How much is enough kindness? It's not an exact science like the other laws could be. So the Rashba said, you're not fully, um, it's not fully in your power to do it, so it's difficult. The second approach of our Budram in the 14th century is, it's not great circumstances when you're helping someone who's poor in front of you, and it's not the time for a bracha. 
they're in hardship and difficulty. You don't want to associate blessings with that sad situation. It might not be appropriate. Uh, the Tartmima in the, in, the in the end of 19th century, beginning of 20th century, there's number C here, he said, the reason you'd make a bracha for these is they're not limited to being Jewish. In other words, the, the mitzvah between you and God are instructions for the Jewish people to do. It comes keeping the Sabbath and Pesach and so on. But these are universal. Everyone should be involved in these. So why make a blessing for them? They're not particular to, to, to God commanding you, but all of society should be doing them. So Rabbi Sachs read these different arguments and he pieced it together and suggested a fourth approach, which relates to what you were saying. He says, normally, when you make a bracha, you have to have intention of what you're doing. It's called kavana. So say it's Rosh Hashanah and you're not interested at all and you walk past the shul and you happen to hear a noise coming out, right, of the shofar. And you go, oh, a bit annoying, and keep walking. <laughs> Have you fulfilled the law of shofar? What do you think? Right? No. Why? Because you didn't intend to do it, right? Or you didn't do it with a belief and understanding. But if you make Kiddush on Shabbat... Right? You have to have intention of why you're doing it. Now, I'll give you an example, by the way, and I'm, I'm very open about this. I come from an Orthodox tradition, and there's people here who are conservative and reform. And in the modern times, and you'll find this interesting, um, there were questions between Orthodox being with reform and whether they accept different, uh, different approaches. And a question that came in the modern time was, if you're an Orthodox Jew and you hear a Reform Jew make Kiddush, does it count? <laughs> For them, because if you don't believe, and I'm being, that's why I, I don't try and avoid these issues. I'm up front about it because we discuss it, right? And the classic example in England is so in England, right, that you know, if an Orthodox Jew on Shabbat, you're not going to get in the car. If you're a form, you would. And in England, what do people do on a Saturday? Watch the football, right? Go and see the game. So the scenario that Rabbi Sachs talks about is you're invited to Kiddish at someone's house, right, a, form of, or a different Jew, a form, and, and they're, they're giving whiskey, which is kosher, whatever, and they're making Kiddish, and you can see the tickets for the game that afternoon on the windowsill, <laughs> right? And they're going later. And this, by the way, was a question asked, Binyan Sion, it's a responser of an Orthodox rabbi in the uh, beginning of the 20th century, right? Well, they asked, if the, if the person makes Kiddish, does it count? And the answer was, yes. If that person believes in some way that God made the world and rested on the seventh day and sanctified it, and therefore that person is making Kiddush, it counts. You don't need to judge what else they are doing. In that moment, if their intention understands it and the food is kosher and so on, then you can answer Amen. Right? It's very important to me, this, because I think there's, there's often sometimes fracture, fractiousness between different denominations in Judaism. So it's important to understand, this response, sir, that there can be, to, to an extent, an understanding and respect for each other. And that's an example. That's an example of intention. If you intend to do the law, you can do it, right? You need a blessing. But Rabbi Sachs says, intention is not important. This is an amazing statement he makes when you're doing actions of interpersonal relations. I don't care why you're doing it, he says, as long as you do it. Look at the paragraph, I'll quote from the book. He says, An act between us and another human being, however, has a different character. What matters is not the act, but its result. What matters in the act of tzedakah, charity or chesed, kindness, is that we help the needy, alleviate the poverty of the poor, ease the distress of bereaved. The point of the command is its effect on the world, on another person. Motives are irrelevant to acts, the purpose of which is to bring aid to those who are in need. It's quite a radical statement. And he proves it. On the second page, he actually proves it with a quote from the Talmud. There's a good look at this quote from the Talmud. It says the following. Ha'omer, if a person says, this sum of money which I'm giving to charity is in order to save the life of my child. So imagine a person gives money to a hospital only because they want to save their own child, not anybody else's. Or to ensure they get a place in the world to come. So a person goes and gives charity and goes, I don't really care about these people, but I want to get to the world to come. Right? So I want to get extra as many mitzvahs as I can to make sure that I get to the world to come and I'm all fine. What does the Talmud say? Harezer tzaddik gamor. Such a person is completely righteous. What? How can they be completely righteous? They're only doing it to win points. They're only doing it for their own child. Rabbi Sack says, because the Talmud understands, it would be nice if you cared, but at the end of the day, 
you gave a donation to charity. Whether you, you, you had the right intention or not, it's going to help people, right? Whether you're only going there because a child, because your parents told you, go and visit grandma and be nice and, you know, eat her cakes and talk to her, right? And whether you do it because you want to or not, you did that act. She felt that kindness. Intention doesn't matter. It's an incredible point to make. Right? And now we get to what Doris said very early on. Look at the paragraph he then says. A command between us and other people needs no blessing because it requires no special intent. Someone was in need, we gave. Someone was ill, we visited. Someone was lonely, we invited them home. The religious character of the moment lay not in the motive for which it was performed, but the comfort given, the help received, the loneliness lifted. Far from needing a blessing, the act itself is a blessing. It's such an amazing point. Okay? And I'll tell you a story that Rabbi Sachs told me, which is a, a, an example of this. Um, it was the time that he met Seamus Heaney. I don't know if you've heard of him. He was a great English poet. He won a Nobel Prize in 1995 for poetry. He actually translated Beowulf, um, one, uh, one of the excellent translations. And Rabbi Sachs had, now I don't know if you know this, there's a blessing that you say when you meet a great person who's not Jewish, who's a great wise person, who grave of his uh, uh, wisdom to human beings. The blessing that you say when you meet a great person. And the question is, how great do they have to be? <laughs> right? So you meet your high school teacher, and you're there. How, so Rabbi Sachs' policy was Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> right? It's world recognition. Right, by the way, he got the Templeton Prize in England for faith. It's an incredible prize, which he once pointed out to me. Nobel Prize, Templeton Prize, is a million pounds, which is more than the Nobel Prize. He just pointed out to me that <laughs> it's, it's worth more, he said. Um, uh, I was there, actually, when he got the prize. And one other rabbi said next to me, he goes, if they give me that money, I'd buy a boat. So I said, that's why they didn't give you the money. Right? <laughs> it's the people who won't buy boats who they give money to, so do w work with faith. So anyway... When Rabbi Sachs met Shemis Heaney, he said to him, you know, you're a great scholar. There's a Jewish tradition to make a blessing. When you meet a great scholar, can I make their blessing to you? And Shemis Heaney said yes, and he made the blessings in 1996 when he met him after the Nobel Prize. And Shemis Heaney turned around and said, Rabbi Sachs, I need to tell you something. When I was a young boy in Northern Ireland, I was a Shabbos goy. <laughs> Right? I don't know if you're hearing these stories. What's a Shabbos goy? Someone who, right, before electricity, when Jews on Shabbat could not light a fire. It's actually in Exodus, chapter 35. You mustn't light a fire in your homes on Shabbat. So you would ask a non-Jew to come in, right, and light the fire. I mean, it's turning out, everyone, there's all these stories, Elvis with the Shabbos goy, all these different Shabbos goy. But Seamus Heaney told the story that I would go on a Friday in the evening and light the fire or light it in the morning to, for, the, for the family in order to have a Shabbat. And then Seamus Heaney told Rabbi Sachs a story. He said, I did this for a, a year for this Jewish family, and, and I was a teenage boy at the time, and to thank me, they gave me a gold coin. To thank me, after Shabbat, they called me over and gave me this gold coin. I was so happy that I had this, and I went home to my mother and showed her, look what, look, look what the family gave me. And, she, and he said, you know, what did my mum do? She clipped me around the ear, said, take the money back, and said the following, never take money to help another person worship God. Um. And Rabbi Sachs said, you see what I learned from this man? You don't take money to help someone else. Because it's not about some kind of intentional thing you do, it's the right thing that you do. So it's interesting that it relates in this issue in his book, where he writes about this, that an act of kindness is a religious act. You don't need to mumble or say Hebrew words in order to do it. And the Torah, the rabbis, understood that. It doesn't make it less important. The reason we do blessings is to focus our minds and to be aware. I was once in a conversation, in a dialogue with, a, with a, a Buddhist. And he talked about how important intention is in Buddhism. Right? That before you drink water, you focus and you think about what the meaning of this water is and its place in you, and then you drink. And I said, we have a similar situation. We make a blessing as a similar idea. And then someone asked me, what's the difference between Buddhism and Judaism? Right? And so I, I, I thought about it because I wanted a, just a, a clear one-line answer. 
And I said, um, so I, I, actually, I, I told a story, first of all, which was about a rabbi in London called Rabbi Rosen. And Rabbi Rosen loved Hasidic thought and Hasidic ideas. And he ran a synagogue that was very alive. And he was very upset about the old-style synagogues that didn't make Judaism exciting. Right? And he said about these synagogues, he said, the problem with these synagogues is they're like a pub that hasn't got any beer. <laughs> So you walk in, and it smells great, and it's got all the wood, and it's all lovely. And you sit down, but there's no beer to drink. Okay? So, um, and I said, the difference between Judaism and Buddhism, possibly, is, is that what's happening to Judaism today is we're a pub which often hasn't got any beer. Whereas Buddhism is beer without the pub. <laughs> Because right? Buddhism doesn't necessarily have a whole system of origins. It's just about that act itself. So we were kind of debating beer and pubs in that, in that whole process, <laughs> which was quite interesting. But um, wh what I'm trying to show you here in this, in this book, this example is, and for Roy Sachs, this solved the problem we began with. Remember? Autonomy and authority. Because a person, a modern person, wants to choose how they live their life and not feel commanded to do it. But by Sachs' response is... But what's the purpose of your life? What do you want to do? What values do you live by? Because those values you are commanded by. Once you accept you're supposed to do them, then you always have to do them. And therefore, in a sense, they're commanded upon you. And by Judaism recognizing that some acts don't need a blessing because the act itself is, is, is valuable, that's a form of authority on you. So what do I mean by that? So uh, it's a quote I want to give actually from a philosopher who said, you know, King Solomon said, go to the, the, spa, go to, the ant to see how to live your life. But uh, another modern philosopher said, why don't you look at a spider? What does a spider do? A spider weaves a web from inside itself, right? That's where the web comes from, and then lives in it and calls it home. Now, wherever your morals come from, if they're traditional from the Torah as a religious Jew, or the ones that you've developed, they're only real moral values if they control the way you will act. If you'll always compromise them on, on them, then they're not moral values. Right? It's the principle of Groucho Marx. He used to say, I've got principles, and if you don't like them, I've got others. <laughs> right? That's not the approach. Right? These, are, these, are, these are lines that you won't cross. What are your moral principles? I teach children in high schools, and we learn Jewish values, and I ask the children to write, these are teenagers, to write their own moral compass. We do a little, little uh, piece of paper this size. We learn different Jewish values and say, which ones mean the most to you? I want you to write out your moral compass, what you will do and not do, and keep it with you and carry it wherever you go which means basically take out your phone, take off the plastic back, <laughs> shove it in there, put it back on your phone, because you're never without your phone, right? <laughs> and I say, and next time you're making a choice, don't just react at the time, base it on the values that you hold by. That's what a moral compass is. We often don't have it. When they begin to do that, they're accepting an idea of authority. Even if it came from inside themselves, they live in and call it home, or they get it from the Torah. That's what a moral respons res responsible person does. And so few of us live in that way. We just make a moral decision at the time. We don't say, that's not what I do, that's not how I live, I won't do that. I'll just make a moral judgment at the time, that's not the way to live. What by Sachs is saying is by unifying your, what needs to be done in the world, you have a moral responsibility and who you are, and the needs of the world, by, uh, by joining those together, authority and autonomy come together. He explains this in this paragraph, which I've got directly from the book here on your handout. Let me read it to you. Um, he says, Immanuel Kant famously defined morality as the universal imperative. Act only on a maxim through which you can at the time, you can, you can at the same time will, that it should be become a universal law. This is Kantian philosophy. My daughter's studying philosophy now in university, so she's, she, she checks up that I get this accurate. But Kant's idea was that it's a moral act if you can, the act you're doing now, you would universalize that everybody should do. But by Sachs says, I don't agree. And many modern philosophers have as well. Why? He says, perhaps that is what morality is to the mindset of reason. Right? There, sure, there, surely, there surely are universal imperatives. For instance, don't murder. Right? Don't, don't injure the innocent. Don't rob or steal. Don't lie. 
Those are rules we learn as children. If we fail to learn them, others quickly teach us. The interesting part of the moral life, though, is the grown-up part, which comes not in universals, but in particulars. It speaks to me here now. This person, in this situation, at this time. It knows my name. It calls to me, not the person next to me. So, true, giving charity, we all do. But in terms of an act of kindness, if you have a better relationship with that person, you're the one that needs to talk to them. You understand? So it's not a universal moral imperative. It's dependent on who you are and maybe your particular skills. So when you overlap between, when you as a young person discover what you're really good at and then what the world needs and those two come together, then you will discover your purpose in life. And many of us are always trying to find this. There are some things we're good at, but people don't need them. Or other things that are needed, but you're not good at helping that. You wouldn't be the great person to do that, okay? So you have to find the overlap between those two worlds. I'm not a great singer, I'm not a great musician, I'm not going to give peace and love to people by becoming a musician. It'll be very, very bad, no one will show up. It's not me. So if I discover what my abilities are, and something that the world needs, and the two come together, then my personal individuality and the challenge of morality in the world comes together and have a purpose. That's all Bay Sachs is talking about here. He says the following. It says, this is the voice, it says, there's an act only you can do, a, situa a situation only you can address, a moment that, if not seized, may never come again. God commands in generalities, but calls in particulars. God knows our gifts, and God knows the needs of the world. That is why we are here. There is an act only we can do, and only at this time, and that is our task. The sum of these tasks is the meaning of our life, the purpose of our existence, the story we call upon to write. God's call is almost inaudible. I translate the biblical phrase, a still small voice from Kings, as the voice we can only hear if we are listening. But it is there, and if from time to time through our lives we create a silence in our soul, we will be able to hear it. There's no contradiction between individuality, right, and your own desire to live meaningfully to yourself, and actually feeling of responsibility to the world which is beyond you. When the two come together, you know, by Sachs's line, where what we want to do means what's crying out to be done, that's where you should be. And he finishes off and says, there is no life without a task, no person without a talent, no place without a fragment of God's life, uh, God's light waiting to be discovered and redeemed, no situation without its possibility of sanctification, no moment without its call. It may take a lifetime to learn how to find these things. But once we learn, we realise in retrospect that all it ever took was the ability to listen. When God calls, he does not do so by way of universal imperatives. When God calls, he does so, God does so, that God, um, instead God whispers our name. And the greatest reply, the reply of Abraham, is simply Hineni. Here I am, ready to heed your call, to mend a fragment of your all too broken world. It's an incredible way of reading, and that's why his book is called to heal a fractured world, the ethics of responsibility. Um, I read Rabbi Sachs' books as they came out. You know, it's like people who say, I read Harry Potter as they were written. <laughs> so for my 18th birthday, Rabbi Sachs wrote his first book, and I, my, my, uh, my mother bought it for me. And every year, because he was very good at writing books, it came out, and I read as they came out. This is a wonderful guide for moral responsibility. It's a brilliant book with all the sources and many stories. It's really worth getting hold of. If you look anything from tonight, you, you order this book, it's really worthwhile to do. But he is trying to show that Jewish values aren't some separate issue from the needs of the world. The Torah was a response to human need in society. And there are many ways of doing it. Jews aren't the only people around the table, right? But Jewish values have a place around the table of ideas. I always have that joke about, you know, different countries bring different things to the table. You know, what do the Swedish bring? They bring the table. 
because of Ikea, right? So I've always liked that joke, but whatever. Anyway, the point is, is that we have a place around the table. Are we better than other people? Are we worse? We're just another faith, another belief system around the table. But we have a contribution to give to the world. Um, uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel, a great philosopher of the last century, right, when he was asked, what does it mean to be a Jew? He said, the Jewish people, there's a great one-liner, he said, the Jewish people are the messengers of God who have forgotten the message. <laughs> and I love telling teenagers that. Because they go, but Rabbi, what's the message? And I go, let's learn. And you'll find out. But it, it, can you see that inspires somebody? You've got a role in the world. Well, the Torah asked the Jewish people to bring something special to the world. Not better or worse than anybody else, but one particular obligation. And many Jews today, I know, feel like that weight of responsibility. You know, don't be the one that breaks the chain, what the Holocaust, all that kind of stuff. And it's a very negative view of Judaism. And by Sachs turns it on his head. It's not, it's not, it's not a, an obligation. It's an opportunity. Do you want to live a meaningful life? Do you want to be part of this? This is your opportunity. And my proof that you should never tell someone you've got to be a Jew because what about if you don't, what will happen to the millions? I prove it from the Bible with the story of Queen Esther. Remember, Queen Esther is married to King Ahasuerus, Xerxes, we know historically, and the Jewish people are going to be destroyed by Haman. And Mordechai, who's related to Esther, goes and says to her, you've got to go and do something. And he doesn't say to her, you better do this because otherwise it's all over. Right? And the Jewish will be destroyed. It's all up to you. You're going to save it. He says, you, got to, you can help. But if you don't, if you don't, somehow else will be saved. Because God will look after us. It's an amazing verse. In that verse where you expect him to say, you've got to do this right now, otherwise it's all over. He doesn't. He says to her, we, we'll probably get saved, but you can do this. And some interpreters say, what it means he's saying to her is, look, the Jewish people have been around for a thousand years. We'll probably still survive, right, without you. But this is your opportunity to stand up and be part of this great project of thousands of years. And if it can be meaningful to you, it's a wonderful opportunity to do something meaningful for yourself and also helpful for others at the same time. That's the point Rabbi Sachs is making. When you can make an overlap between what you only can do, you realise what your abilities are and what the world needs, then you found your purpose and you're living in line with Jewish tradition. So that's just one idea I wanted to teach you tonight from Rabbi Sachs. Thank you very much. Sure. I have, um, I think, Lonnie, have you got a couple of minutes for questions? Should we do that? Any comments? I'm very happy because there's, there's, there's still some more food. But if anybody got any questions or comments, then I'm happy to hear or answer. When I um, share about the... Uh Ah, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I've, I've written a book which is it's going to take another six or seven months to get edited um, at the moment about uh, responses to challenging questions. It's a very long book, but I wrote about five years ago this, which is called Big Questions, Brief Answers. And it's uh, 400, 400, 500 word responses to lots of different questions in Judaism. And it was actually published, it was really originally written for teenagers, but lots of adults said, could we have one too? It's because it's written in very straightforward language, and each one has a, a story or a Jewish idea in response to the questions. Um, and I try not to avoid the questions. I always hated that when you ask a rabbi a question, and they say lots of wonderful things, and they haven't actually answered your question. So I try and always answer the question. So there's 33 questions there in terms of religion and science, which we were talking about earlier, um, relations between Jews and non-Jews, about, you know, can I just be a good person? Do I need to be Jewish? right, and, and eating kosher, all these different kind of things. So there's a one for all of you to take home as a, as a present. But any comments or questions? Yeah. But any comments or questions? Yeah. Sure. I just finished reading Immorality. Right, yeah, his, yeah, his last book, yes. Could you comment on his view of I and we? Well, by Sachs, I and we? Yeah. Yes, he talks about our society is very much an I society, not just the iPhone, but everything else as opposed to we thinking in terms of community. Um, we, it's, a, it's a problem that we have in our society. It's very individuated. Again, I'm responding to that in, through this book. So d d did you like what he wrote about there? Yeah. yeah, he's talking about that we're missing that understanding of what we can do. All right? I, I, let me quote Bono from U2, great <laughs> pop band. He said, I can't change the world, but we can. 
Simple idea, same point as well. It's understanding. And the problem we have is the kind of hero view of history is that it was, you know, Churchill who won the... I'm a big fan of Churchill. Individual heroes are the key person. It's not how it works. They're offered as a leader who unifies and inspires, but they came from a, from a society, a group who supported their ideas. And so this great hero belief in, in history is flawed. Not just because it's mainly male as well, but it's flawed. There's often people behind, you know, they say behind every great man is a very surprised woman. Um, <laughs> but uh, but, but more, no, more to the point is it's often about... Hum Can I give one example of that, by the way? Um, Einstein, uh, one of my heroes. He did special relativity in 1905, which is like the uh, relative motion of, uh, of a standard um, velocity. But for acceleration, he, it was a, a limited idea of relativity in 1905. He needed to generalise it to the general theory of relativity. He only published it in 1915. It took him 10 years to do it because the maths was too hard. And when you read the history, his wife had a PhD in mathematics. And she explained to him the tensor algebra you needed to do it. So on BBC, they once did a brilliant dramatisation of Einstein's life. And there's this amazing... I've never forgotten it. It's affected the way I look at the world and gender and all these issues. It shows Einstein sitting at the table, working on the maths. And the wife is holding the baby, stirring the soup, going, no, no, divide! Add the one there, you'll see. <laughs> right? And it's the whole different... You know, the man, the ideal man in his writer's garret, having philosophical ideas and changing the world. And it wasn't that. His wife helped him with the maths because he found it difficult. And when I was in university, I did uh, math and physics, my tutor gave me a book called A Hundred Theories of Relativity. There are many others who were writing it. The reason they chose Einstein's ultimately because he did special. But the book only happened because of his wife. So often we, don't, we think of the individual that does things, but it's always communities that build something. When you have a great leader, it's because of the society in which they were built. They might have been great and taken it one step further and unified the people, Bhavad Rebbe is a great example, but he came from a tradition of other Rebbe's, of other, other learning. And without that community, we'd be nothing. And that's why Jewish communities are so important. We look after each other and we celebrate in times of joy and in times of pain and hardship, we support each other. And that communing is that third sector that I talked about. We're not just voters, we're not just politically minded or economically minded. We have to be human in of ourselves. Even if I can't give you any money, even if I can't vote for you, we care for each other just by virtue of being human. And that's the we in society. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. Oh, I'm, no I'm, I'm nervous now. <laughs> Go on. What did um, Rabbi Sachs have to say about why good, uh, bad things happen to good people? Um, he would sometimes say, why do bad people happen to good things? He would answer that. But he says, and I actually got a video about this issue, and he said, I'm out, I'll send you the link, he said, you know, we can't answer, and maybe we shouldn't. Because if you can explain why that happened, and ultimately the Holocaust or whatever, why that happened, that's not a world that should exist that can justify and explain that. So God doesn't tell us, because we mustn't know. That's what his response was. Don't you think that's a bit evasive? It can be. But the person he spoke to at the time, it meant something to them. Because what people don't like is apologetic answers. Nothing can justify certain things. Elie Wiesel, who's one of my heroes, you know, Holocaust survivor, won a Nobel Prize. Um, he was brought up as a religious Jew. And if you read Night, which I recommend you to read, I don't like talking Holocaust stuff, because it's always like people go for that, but it's a, it's a brilliant book, Night, because it's, it's about a religious Jew and how the challenges of the experience. And when, and when he was in the camps, his Rosh Hashiva, he was working, and there was a great rabbi with him, and they would quote Talmud by heart to each other while lifting rocks. And, and after the war, Elie Wiesel was in France. He was an orphan, he lost his whole family, and uh, he was less religious, and it was, he was in, a, a, in an orphanage in 1945, and he was there for three years. And in 1948, like many other people listening on the radio, and heard the state of Israel being declared. And he said, well, I'll go to shul. It's an amazing moment, right? We've got the state of Israel back. I'm going to go to shul. And in his shul, the rav there, it's a very famous rabbi um, who taught him. And many others said to the rabbi, we've got the state of Israel. Isn't that amazing? And the rabbi goes, the rabbi said to him, it's not enough. Nothing can justify the Holocaust.
And it's an amazing experience, like Wiesel, who's finding his faith and coming back, and the rabbi says to him, who's in shul praying, you can't justify this. Don't ever try and justify this. But by Sachs called the Holocaust, or these events, as black holes in Jewish history. What does a black hole do? It sucks in all light. You can't find a justification. Any justification is disrespectful to the people that died. And that's why he says we can't understand and make meaning on that. I give a different answer in the book, which you can read about. But I think to balance, I mean, my, my approach is slightly different, but to try and balance and understand those ideas maybe is beyond us. The Jewish response isn't why, but what are you going to do about it? Okay? The famous uh, Hasidic story is the, 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 the Talmud, uh, the, the young boy goes to his teacher and he goes, Rabbi, how can God, who is perfect, make a world that is not and the Rebbe goes to him, do you think you could do better? <laughs> and, and stumbling and embarrassed, the, 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 the child, the student says, well, I can try. So the Rebbe goes, fine, go, go and do it. Make the world better. Now, you might say he's avoiding the answer, but I think he is answering. The answer to those questions is what are you going to do about it? That is an answer. It's not a philosophical answer, but it's a meaningful human answer. Make the world better. Um, yeah, there's a whole story about that, but it's, it's late in the evening, so enough, enough on that issue. But so I hope you've seen how Judaism responds to those things. What do we do about it? Yeah. Uh, since you knew Rabbi Sachs, uh, what was your sense in the latter part of his life about how he responded? And I don't know, I think it was beginning to happen, the emergence of authoritarianism, or the re-emergence of authoritarianism. We certainly can talk about the 30s or 40s. How did he understand that, or how did he see it in light of his own thinking about pluralism and, and the way we share our our identities and our moral? Well, it's important. Rabbi Sachs wasn't a pluralist. He wasn't a pluralist. He didn't believe in pluralism. Right? For him, pluralism was equal value of all different views, and he says that negates the self-definition of traditional orthodoxy. Right? I think I contain a truth. And even in, even in his book, Dignity of Difference, he makes that point. Well, by Sachs believed in is what's called inclusivism, which is that I, the reason you believe in something might be different to me, but we can share together. So, for instance, interfaith relations. But by Sachs wasn't into what he called face-to-face -face relations. Let me tell you, you know, Jewish philosophy, and then a Christian priest, let me tell you Christian philosophy, and have philosophical debate. He wasn't into that. He didn't believe in what he called face-to-face. -face. He believed in what's called side-by-side. -side. What does that mean? There are challenges in the world problems in the, in the family, in society. You value it, I value it, let's do a project together to make the world better. So again, responding in that same kind of way. So that was on a particular issue. In terms of authoritarianism, do you want to be more specific of what you mean in terms of... Because I, I can't... He was a political philosopher, so he must have thought about uh, social systems that removed uh, choice uh, or even vote. Mm. Uh, uh, how when the we becomes... Right, too controlling, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because he talks about two kinds of language that we need to learn. There's the personal language of our faith and the general language of society and what the relationship is between the two. But he did believe there are some universal ethics. Um, he talked about it like, um, even though there's multiple languages in this world, if you talk to a, a, um, a somatician, actually, that there are basic structures by which we communicate. And uh, there are, he believed, universal moral principles that we all have to understand and relate to. And if people cross those, then you have a right to challenge those. But working out what those are and the limitations of that is a difficult issue. I understand. He was very careful never to say what, what he voted on, which place he stood. He said it's a personal choice to do. And it's not for a rabbi to tell a person how to vote which side or the other. So he was very careful about that. Um, for me, you know, in Israel, I want moral morality and Torah ethics to be in all the parties. It should be as part of our, as I mentioned earlier, this moral compass to help us make decisions and what we do. But because there is a third sector, political, economic and religious or moral, whatever you want to call it, um, you mustn't confuse the political and that. So it can influence the political, but it's your choice, your best understanding of how society can work. Right, what will be the most effective way of fixing our society? That's the important question here. It's not ideologically, politics is not ideologies. It's like, what's going to be best for our society? 
You know, you might not like particular uh, democratic or, or Republican leaders, but that's separate from their politics in terms of if you can stand for that and how you deal with those issues. In the UK, it was a huge issue. There are many Labour-supporting Jews. And when Corbyn came to power, who was a, you know, anti-Semite, they didn't know what to do. They literally didn't know what to do. It was a really very problematic time. Um, but in, in England, it actually taught society about anti-Semitism as well. And something I learned from Rabbi Sachs, he set up in the UK a cross-parliamentary, I told Peter about this actually yesterday, a cross-parliamentary group to fight anti-Semitism. He wanted members of parliament from different um, parties to join together and to do this group. And he helped set it up and he made one condition. It mustn't be led by a Jewish member of parliament. He said, anti-Semitism is not a Jewish problem. It's a societal problem. And I don't want a Jew running it. I want a non-Jew to understand that. And a lot of di people disagree. We understand it better. We know the history. We're so he goes, that's not the point. Society, they, the, a society, the members of parliament have to take responsibility for this issue. And to this day it exists and a non different MP stands and run this party and it fights anti-Semitism and it's now beyond party lines, which is such an important idea. So many of the political decisions he did and he influenced Tony Blair and other leaders um, have really helped society in, a, in an incredible way. Thank you. Anyone, I think we've got time for one more. Any more comments? Peter. A question, a little different. And by the way, I have to thank Peter and Lonnie. Before, before you get to speak, I have to thank Peter and Lonnie look after me and do wonderful things for this community and many others. And we must be thankful and appreciative of their, of their kindness and generosity. So thank you personally. And uh, if you want to know a good book to read, talk to Peter, because he's always reading good books. Yes. Uh, so a question, because I know you, and I know your journey, your personal journey. And I've never asked you this question, which is, you, you studied uh, physics, and you obviously accomplished and could have gone down that path. And at some point in time, you opted to be a Jewish scholar. Tell me about that. Well, I could say something inspiring, or I could be honest. <laughs> so I'll be honest. I'll be honest. So when I published my, I did quantum chaos theory. Right, for those interested, that's, you know, quantum mechanics and classical mechanics, whatever's true in classical has to be in quantum. So chaos theory is a classical phenomena. You've seen the fractal patterns, fractals. So I tried to make fractals in quantum mechanics. Don't worry if you didn't follow that. When I was asked at a dinner party, what do you do in physics? It always led to silence. So, <laughs> so I tried to make up funny, clever things. But um, uh, so I published a number of papers. Right, and in order, in order to, so in, in, in Physical Review E, if anyone knows their papers, it's like if you get in a good journal, then when you have your Viva for your PhD, they can't fail you. Um, but when I published the paper and I got the report back, they put pedagogically strong, this person should teach physics. And I read that review, right, saying, you know, you're, you're an okay physicist, but you're a really good teacher, and you should be a teacher of physics. And when, they were busy, and when you're told you're okay at something, you're not great, you don't want to do that for your living, for your life. I was an okay physicist, right? I solved some issues, but I found it very challenging and very difficult, and the maths was very difficult. Um, but they said to me, you're good at teaching. And I felt that was a, a voice telling me, you've always been teaching on the side, teach what you love. And I've always loved Jewish teaching, and so I became a Jewish educator. I only became a rub five years later. Why? Rabbi Sachs. He said, Rafi? It's about time, okay? You've got a PhD, you're a scientist, you can explain things, you need to become a rabbi as well. So I said, yes, Rabbi Sachs. <laughs> <laughs> and I trained to be a rabbi, and five years later, he, he wrote, he, you know, when you get smicha, rabbinic ordination, it's signed by rabbis, and my great honor is one of the signatures is his, that he tested me um, and, and, and made me rabbi. So I feel a great responsibility to pass on his ideas and share with other people. So, um, yeah, he wasn't a messianic figure. He wasn't a superhuman. He was a very normal person who did amazing things, which is why it's inspiring, okay? You know, he didn't go to a Jewish primary school. He went to Christ College <laughs> Elementary School. <laughs> you know? The funny thing is now, that has been bought by an ultra-Orthodox uh, group called Pardes House, and now it's an ultra-Orthodox Jewish school <laughs> in the same building. So when they invited Rabbi Sachs there for prize day, he walked in and he said, you know, 
I went to this school <laughs> for 50 years ago, right? 60 years ago. And they're like, but it wasn't a Jewish school then. He goes, I know. <laughs> so it's a very funny story. But, you know, people think, oh, he was a great man. That's why he did great things. He didn't have the most amazing background, but he worked on himself. Uh, and the value of a person is not what they're born with, but the arc of what they do with the gifts they've been given and the time that they have. And it's an inspiring story, right, for what, what can you do? And that's what, again, that book's about. So uh, I wrote, when I, uh, when I heard he'd passed away, I, I wrote some pieces, and, um, and people said to me, you know, Rafi, no one can fill Rabbi Sachs' shoes. And I said, I know, no one can, but he wouldn't want us to. He'd want us to fill our own shoes. And that's the challenge. Anyway, thank you so much. There's more food. Have a great evening. And come and get a book. Thanks so much. Be well. Have a great week.